I'm blessed with your favor. I'm blessed with your favor. Forever and ever and ever and ever. I'll trust in your greatness. 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 Forever and ever and ever and ever. I'm blessed with your favor. 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 Forever and ever 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 my will, you said, not my will, but thy will be done. You gave your back to the smiters, and from those that pulled out the beard, you did not refuse. They spit on you, and they put a crown on you. They did everything they could to try to stop you and block you. But just for me, not talk too much for I won't be able to say Lord I thank you for what you did for me on Calvary I don't know about nobody else but I thank you for what you did just for me hallelujah Oh. 
songs we sing. So much more than that emblem on your chain. But in these dying dreams, from the chains of slavery, and the bloody shell
and the character of God. You have to learn, you have to know the nature and the character of God. Now, these men who I have listed here are men who knew the nature and character of God because they walked with God. Amen? Uh, Abraham, Joseph, the three Hebrew boys, David, and of course Jesus, they all walked with God. And so I'm just going to give you uh, some paraphrased um, things that they said concerning God and you can go to scripture and find these things but today is not I'm not this is not about uh, you knowing the verses as much as you know what they said so these things are what they said about God Abraham said I know in whom I believe and I'm fully persuaded 
and I could add to that, he said that he is able. That he is able. He said, I know in whom I believe, and I am fully persuaded that he, God, is able. Now, this is what Abraham said. Now, we know that God asked Abraham to go into some tough situations down in Egypt and um, all across the journey that he went, having to go and save Lot and many things. He asked him to go to a land that he had never seen and a place that he didn't know anything about. And so in the midst of him learning God, Abraham said, I know in whom I believe and I'm fully persuaded that he, God, is able. Now, Joseph also went through some trying times, was thrown in the pit by his brothers, put into slavery in Potiphar's house, into the prison, and then up to the palace. He had to trust God in every situation. And when it came time to explain to his brothers who thought that they had uh, done something to him that would cost them their life, he said this concerning God. He said, what the devil meant for evil, my God has turned for my good. This is what he saw. So, so when you know the character of God, you can be in the, in the face of a situation that other people would be angry and bitter and of no use to God. But if you know his character then you will be able to still be used by God even after he take you through something. That's important today because we're all going through something right now. This COVID-19 is taking us through something, and today another a storm is coming, which may take us through some more. And if you don't believe that he is able and that you're fully persuaded in whom you believe, then you may turn back. And you got to read your Bible and know that in the book of Revelation, it talks about people turning back. Jesus himself said that the love of the body would turn cold. And so we got to know that the devil is working things for evil. But to those who know God, he says he's turning it for our good. Jesus said it this way in Romans 8. I mean, Paul said it this way in Romans 8. All things work together for the good of them that love God. See, if you know him and his character, it doesn't matter what folk are doing to you. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. The only thing that really matters is that you know God and you know that, yeah, he might do that, but he's never going to leave me, nor forsake me. Amen? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know that they got put in a hot situation. Here they are facing the fiery furnace because of their belief, because they refused to bow, because they refused to dance to the world's music. And they said about God this, whether he delivers us or not, we know he is able. This is knowing the character of God. This is not about situational ethics. But all the people that I'm listening for you are people who had to deal with situations but learn about God that he can be trusted to do what he said. He may not be able to be trusted to do what I want him to do, but I can trust him to do what he said he would do. And here's David. We looked at this uh, in the last two weeks several times. In Psalm 22 he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On further down, he said, bulls of Bashan have encompassed me. They, they surrounded me. He said, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is what David said about the God who he loved and, and, and trusted. How can you trust God knowing that he's saying this and David didn't know why he was showing him this but what, he, what, what it ended up being that the son of David, Jesus Christ, will be the one. But David said, I got to write what he says. I can't write what I want to write. See, you can't be like Balaam. Balaam wanted to say something different than what God was saying. But what God has blessed is blessed. And you can't curse it. 
And if God says he going to forsake you for a minute, he going to pierce your hands and your feet. The, the world is, in itself going to compass you around. It doesn't mean that God going to leave you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You got to know God's character. Amen. Bad, right, and wrong of God. I had so many people in the last few weeks tell me that God is not behind this. And I, and I was afraid. I mean, not afraid, but I was sad to have to tell them that you better read your Bible. Don't just read 2 Chronicles 7.14. Read 2 Chronicles 7.13. As he says, if I sin, pestilence, if I sin, famine, if I sin a storm, if I sin a plague, then if my people who are called by my name. So, so you better know God like Abraham knew God. I know in whom I believe and I'm fully persuaded he's able. Whether he deliver me or not, he able. Whether he let me go in the fiery furnace or not, he able. Whether I have to have my hands and my feet pierced or not, he is able. You got to know God. Because he's working his plan. And if in his plan, it means Charles has to go through some dry times and persecution. Being laughed at, talked about. Go through people saying he done fell off. I don't know what happened today, he done fell off. I got to go through that because I know in whom I believe. After David said, they pierced my hands and my feet. That was in Psalm 22. In Psalm 23, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> I shall not want. Amen. The same God who said, great bull is going to encompass you. The same God said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's making me lie down in the green pastures. He's leading me beside the still water. He restores my soul. Yea, though, watch this, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. See, so he said, I know that I'm sometimes going to be walking through the dark valleys, but I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. What am I saying? You must know the character of God. It can't be just that I, 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 don't, I don't believe God will put me through that. You, you remember we said that can't be God. I know that's not God. I know God don't want me to be walking, riding the bus. It can't be God. Want me to take a job making $10 now? hour? You better make sure you know God. Because sometimes he'll send you through something to get somewhere. Jesus said about him, Father, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen? Amen. Even Jesus had to, had to go to God and say, God, are you serious? Is there not another way? But because I know your character, Lord, if you say this is the way, I'm going to walk in it. So this morning, before I even start preaching, I wanted to get some witnesses to help you understand that the things I'm going to say to you today have to do with you knowing God. See, too long we've been making up God as we go. We've been saying, this is God, this is how he is, he's just like me. God concerned with money. We looked at Rare Mike uh, last week and Rare Mike said, my power is money getting power. Rev Ike was like most men. Thinking that God is like him instead of him trying to be like God. Next thing I want to show you, it reminds you of this cross. Before we get started, we'll come back to it. This is you. This is me. This is humanity. Father God is over here. There's a great divide. There's a great divide between us and God. Here we stand. We need to be able to get across. In order for us to get across, there had to be a cross. Amen? We're separated from God. And so Jesus went upon that cross and put his hand in our hand. 
He had his hand in God's hand. And he represented us being reunited with God. When they stretched him out, he reunited us back to the Father. This is the symbol of the cross. That without him, there is no connection. He says, uh, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father except by me. And so, so the cross is not just a symbol, but it is a gateway. It's a portal. It is a power. It is an instrument that ended the thing in us that separated us from God. We'll talk about that in more detail. But I want you to see the cross this morning as something that we need to embrace every day. That's why the songwriter said, uh, uh, near the cross, O Lamb of God, keep its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow over me. We should be walking in the shadow of the cross at all times. If we've been connected back to the Father, then we know that it's because of this. So the shadow of the cross should be over us at all times. The last thing I want to show you this morning before we get started so these things will be in your mind. Is this is us before we meet him. This caterpillar represents us in our old nature. Unable to reach the heights of heaven. The caterpillar has a short lifespan. And is supposed to go through a transformation. Which will cause it. To be able to reach the heights. In order to reach the heights, it's got to go into that cocoon. You see that cocoon there? It hangs sort of like that cross. And when the caterpillar enters it, science tells us that the caterpillar loses everything that it ever was. Only the substrate is remains. Nothing of what the caterpillar looked like remains. If you take this thing and open it up, you won't be able to identify what was in it, what went into it. But after a short while, a new creation comes forth, the butterfly. And like the caterpillar, we needed somewhere to be transformed and that transformation took place for us at the cross. And he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny who he was. Not, no longer will I, will I pursue the life of a caterpillar. Let me deny who I was. The caterpillar has to pull his skin off and go through a lot of changes in order to enter into the cocoon and be changed. There has to be a decision made by the caterpillar. There has to be a decision made by you. If you're ready and want to make that decision, the cross is hanging. It's waiting for you. And you have to be hung, suspended by it. As the caterpillar is suspended by the cocoon, so shall your old nature be suspended by the cross. We talk about it every week. Romans 6 and 6 says, My, we, know that, we know that our old nature, our old man, we know that our old unrenewed self, was nailed to the cross with him. That we no longer would be slaves to sin. That our body, which was the instrument used for sin, would no longer be active for sin. That takes place in this transformation on this cross and we come out a new creation. Hallelujah. This is the message of Easter. That you can be brand new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this morning, I want to bring to your attention all of these things that, that help us to know that God is with us. And that he has a plan for us. Hallelujah. 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 
it is it is imperative for us who are believers that that we know these things. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. I want to bring out a passage that uh, one of my dear brothers brought out this week. And I think it, it speaks. Well, I'll tell you what. Before we go there, uh, let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12. Romans 12. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I want to explain this morning what it is that we have been brought into. What it is we have brought into, been brought into. Romans chapter 12, it says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Everybody say, be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his servicing, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give, give preferred to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation. Devoted to prayer contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind one to an another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen? And so we see here that we've been called to a holy calling. As we talk about the crucified life and the resurrected life, we see that this crucified, this resurrected life is a life that has some expectations on us. Present your body a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable worship. So when you have received this life, your body 
which we said in Romans 6 has been released from its former assignment and slavery to sin now is to be sacrificed unto God. This is what's reasonable. And then after you've allowed your body to be sacrificed, uh, 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 to be given as a sacrifice to God, then there must be the renewing of your mind. This life that we now have, this resurrected life that comes because Jesus has died, it comes to change us and to give us a new uh, uh, perspective on what we are supposed to be pursuing. Our mind has to be changed, transformed, renewed. So that we may prove what the will of God is. How will the world know what the will of God is if we don't transform our minds so that we might be they who live out this will, this purpose. They who do the will of God. They who live as if we belong to him. That's what it means to give your life as a sacrifice. Once a sacrifice has been given at the altar, it cannot be taken back. It is up to those who have the, the, the authority of the altar to decide what they will do with it. Will they slay it and, and, and throw it on the altar to burn? Or will they allow that sacrifice to be used to, 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 to bring about more sacrifices? It's up to them. Your life is not your own. The crucified life is a, is, I mean, the resurrected life is a crucified life, which means your life has been given as a ransom. You have allowed yourself to be hung with him on the cross. You have entered into that place of transformation, never to be the same again. For through the grace given to me, he says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Don't be t thinking about all the stuff you used to do. Talk about I used to have it going on. <laughs> you don't know nothing about me. But see, if we think like that, then we can't give him our life because we will retain it. We will want to hold our life. We want to keep it for our own use. So that we can brag and boast about the things that we do in the body. Sinful things. Things of arrogance and pride. But if I give him my life, then there's no more boasting except in him. So I don't think more highly of myself. But I think it with sound judgment because now I have the measure of faith. He says, for we... Just For just as we have many members in one body and all members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. You have been resurrected into the body of Christ. And now Christ is your life. And now he has brought you so that you might know what function you will have in this body. And individually, we now become members one of another. One of each other. Now, I don't, I'm not my own. A portion of me is in you and you in me because we're all in him. Since we have gifts different, then according to the grace given to us, let each of us exercise them so that we might all benefit. So if I have a prophetic word, it's not for me, it's for you. If I have the ability to exhort, let me not think about what I want to say, but what God will have said to you so that I might exhort and encourage you. If I'm the one who's been given the money to give, see, we like to be the ones, we, we want to be the ones who have the money. But he said, if you've been given this gift, then you need to know how to give with liberality. God needs to be able to manage your purse. 
The spirit of Christ in you needs to be able to let you know that what you have is not all yours, but it because we all are part of one another. I may be having you store up something to take over there to Pastor Charles. Or Pastor Charles, I may be having you store up something to take over there to Pastor Anderson. But because we're all a part of one another, there's no problem. There's no problem. Because if I have the spirit of giving, the gift of giving, then I desire to give as he instructs. He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. God needs all of our gifts in the body, and he needs them so that we might serve one another. So the resurrected life, if you have been born again, and now have, as Paul says in Philippians 3, received this resurrection life, now you also are living a crucified life because there is no resurrection life unless you have been what? Crucified with him. He said, in order for you to reign with him, you must be also crucified with him. You must suffer with him. Maybe you didn't understand what that meant, but this morning I want you to understand what this means. That he died, he was crucified, and then he raised from the dead. Resurrection life coming forth with him. And what I live in now is resurrection life. <laughs> Talked him up. That resurrection life is, is for us if we believe. But that resurrection life is the same as the crucified life. So if I've been resurrected and brought to life, it's because I was crucified. And I will we'll go and look at that in a couple places maybe in just a second. But I want you to understand that when he's given us these instructions in Romans 12, he said, love from the center of who you are. That's what it, uh, verse 9 says in the message. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Let love be without hypocrisy in the New American Standard. Abhor that which is evil, or run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to that which is good. Be a good friend who loves deeply, and practice playing and and, and uh, practice playing second fiddle. Which means I gotta I gotta let you go first. I don't need to be the first one. I don't need to be in front all the time. Yeah. That's what happens when. You have the resurrected life. When you've given your life to him as a sacrifice, now when he renews your mind, you have a different mindset. He said this mind that you have will cause you to bless those who persecute you. He said bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. That's the message. Translation. We need to understand that the crucified life and the resurrection life are one and the same. Let's look at here uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter, well, Galatians. Chapter 4. Begin with verse 19. He says, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now 
and change my tone for I'm perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, rejoice barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout you who are not in labor for more numerous are the children of the desolate than that of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are the children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now also. Somebody say now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So he's saying here that the children who are born of the flesh are in slavery. If you have not allowed this cross to do its work in your life, then you have not lived the crucified life, neither are you living resurrected life. Because if the crucified life comes, it's going to do away with the flesh. Because if you in the flesh, he says you're in slavery even unto now. Jesus died. Romans 6 says, we know. How many times I'm going to go back to it? As many times till we get it. We know that our old unrenewed self, our old nature, our sin nature, our old man was nailed to the cross with him so that our bodies, which once were the container, the instrument used for sin, would no longer be subject to sin. For we know he who dies is no longer in bondage to sin. So this tells me that this flesh that, that Hagar represented is the life that we have before the cross. Every man, every woman is born unto the flesh of the first nature, which is Hagar, which is this bondage to sin. Jesus came so that we might be free. So he went and he died so that the flesh which, which he was carrying would now lose its power and for all who followed him, they also would be able to follow him into this freedom which we call resurrected life. The resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Let's go to Philippians quite quick. Chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Let me just start at the beginning. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me. So for me to keep preaching to you this same message is no trouble to me. And it's a safeguard for you. He said, Beware of the dog. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence, watch this, in 
the flesh. Again, here's the flesh. It is the thing that stood between us and God. Remember I told you we're going to come back to that in my diagram. You see the little man on the cross. This is you. Separated from the Father. Why? Because of the flesh. And so Jesus, going to the cross, took the flesh and he nailed it to the tree. So that we might also. Somebody say me also. Might have my flesh dealt with. He says, I myself have confidence. Excuse me. Although I myself may have had confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh. I far more. I was circumcised the eighth day. Of the nation of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. He said, now, if anybody had some reason to put confidence in the flesh, it was me. Huh? He said, if anybody had a reason to boast about who they were, it was me. I was a Hebrew of Hebrew. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, a special tribe, because you know Benjamin and Judah, they the only ones that made it. I was of the Pharisee, which is the highest set in there, and I was one who believed in the resurrection. So I had a lot to be proud of, and I had a lot of people pushing me up and saying, go boy, you're doing it. He said, but I realized something. Let's see what he said. Verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, everything that, look, look, let me, let me, let me, let me read it from the message. He says, the very credentials these people are waving, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought I, I had going for me is insignificant, like dog dung. Remember I told you like boo-boo on the shoe. Ain't no good. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I can get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. Let me read it again for the New American Standard. Verse 7 says, But whatever things were gained to me, those have I counted as loss. Now, that word is, a, is an accounting word. That means that he had to zero his books out. He had to count it as a loss. Everything he had, on the property and law statement, everything he used to have, he had to put it on the loss column. It no longer was an asset. Y'all don't hear me now. Money folk ought to hear what I'm saying. Folk who, look, who think that money is everything. You understand that Paul said, everything I had that was an asset, I now moved it to the loss column, and it became a negative. Nothing of value anymore. He said, Everything that I had, I counted as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. But this value keep increasing. Amen. Of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Somebody say the loss of all things. See, see, until we're ready to turn loose everything, we won't have everything. Because in him is everything. All things are in him. And you think you got something, but you only got a little something until you get him. When I have him, I have all. But in order to have him, I got to let go of this little bit I think I got. But we're still holding tight to it. He says, For whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. I wish I had time to preach this. You need to understand what it means to let go of everything and then gain Christ. 
it means that everything is on the table. If you decide for something but there's nothing I'm holding on to, y'all. There's nothing I'm holding on to that has more value than him. I counted all his rubbish. If he decided to, to say that some, some has value, that's good. But that's up to him. But I'm not holding on to nothing thinking that it has value. It's only up to him. Because he's my gain. When I gain Christ, he said I may be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. See, here, here it is. Paul said the issue is the life that I want is a resurrected life. So I gave up everything. So I might know him and have in me the power of his resurrection. But he says, though, he's letting us know that the resurrection life is a crucified life. It's a life that ties to his death. I can't have his life without experiencing his death. How do I experience it, Charity? I experience it because I let go of the old man that I was. The old life that I lived. People come looking for Scooter, Cameo, some more folk. They don't live here no more. It's Christ. Amen? Amen. It's good to see you, though. If you want to talk with Christ, we can have a conversation. But other than that, I suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish so that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Oh, my God. Be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him. Somebody say that I may know him. He said in John 17 that this is salvation, that they might know him. That's salvation, knowing him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, watch this, of his suffering. Somebody said a crucified life. The fellowship of his suffering is a crucified life. It means that the life I now live, I live under the shadow of the cross. It doesn't mean that I'm living a life that I don't like. It don't mean that my life is boring. It don't mean that my life is handcuffed and, 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 and cable-toed and pit and foot and all that. I, it means, though, that my life has changed. Now I'm free. We just sang the song. They said, upon the cross my Savior died. The Lamb was crucified. He did that just for me. Now in doing that, he did it so that I might have a life that's now free from slavery. That's what, that's what the songwriter said, right? He said, he's, Don, Don Clerk said, I... This, when he was crucified, he did it just for me so that I could be free from a life of slavery. Slavery to what? Sin. But see, most folk ain't tired of sin. So we didn't care that the preacher didn't say this to us. We didn't care that this wasn't brought forth because I wasn't tired of the slavery yet. I'm still liking my master. And when he said, Go get that, get that young girl. I go get her. Hmm? When you tell that, that, that lady, go mess with that woman's husband, I go do it. When they say, go cheat them folk out their money, I go get it. When they say, take your whole check, and go hang out all night and, and waste the money and don't take nothing home, I go do it. Because I'm a slave to sin and I like it. But for those who are like Paul, have found value in Christ, he said, let it all go. If you try to hold on to some of it, it's going to grab back a hold of you. The thing about, about uh, 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 having wealth and possessions is that possessions possess you. Hmm? That's why it's called a possession. <laughs> you possess with it. 
It got possession of you. You ain't just got it. It got you. But if I let it go, he told the rich young ruler, sell everything you got, give it to the poor. We think that that was a harsh saying. But Jesus was saying, I'm worth more than what you got. I can give you that ten times over. But you got to believe me. But if you possess by your possessions, then you can't do it. And so here we have this Easter morning, a proposition before us. Paul said that I might know him in the power of the resurrection. That you might know the resurrection life. He said it comes with also the fellowship of his suffering. Being conformed to his death. Listen to me now. Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This resurrection life, it costs you something. It has some expectation. And those who went on before us, like Abraham, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joseph, and David, and Jesus himself, they knew the God whom they served. And they understood that it may cost them something to walk with him. But they said, I'm fully persuaded that he's able to bring me through it. They believed with all everything they had that even though God may take them through some changes that was tough. He might take me down to Egypt and I might have to lie and say, that ain't my wife. He may tell me, I'm going to give you a bunch of children and I'm going to let your children be enslaved for 400 years. I may take you down here and your, and your nephew who you shouldn't have brought, he going to get you in a situation that kingdoms can't get themselves out of, but I'm going to send you with some service and you're going to be able to win. I'm going to put you in a situation, Abraham, where all these kingdoms going to want to give you all their possessions. And I'm going to tell you, don't touch none of it. And you know what you're going to say, Abraham? I know in whom I believe. And I'm fully persuaded that he is able. He said, lastly, and most importantly, I'm going to ask you to go up on the mountaintop and take your son, your only begotten son, and make him a sacrifice unto me. And the boy going to have to obey. And you're going to have to obey. And you're going to have to know me. So you can't do it if you don't know him. If you don't know him, if you don't understand his character, how are you going to take your son and lay him on a, on a, up on the mountaintop and take the knife, tie, and ask the boy, be still, boy, let me tie you up. And the boy said, look, father, I see the wood. I, I, I see the rope. I see, I see the fire. Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And you say to the boy, I know God. He'll provide himself. A lamb. You got to know God's character. You can't be running around here reading your Bible believing that the Bible is for you to, to, to figure out what you want out of it. Talking about, I know God, I, I, I'm sure God wouldn't do that. God, God wouldn't send this, this, uh, this, this, this disease. Yes, he will. If you, if you read your Bible, you'll know God will send one. He had told him multiple times, I said it, in Habakkuk 3, he said, plague is before me and pestilence is behind me. That's God. See, I don't have no problem with it, whether God said this or not, because when I read my Bible, I knew that God would do this. He told his children, I'll do it. I will send plague. I will send famine. I will send disease if you don't follow me the way you're supposed to. So then why am I upset with God? Because it don't fit my style. The God I serve is God want me to be cool in the shade all the way with, you know, everything in my everything in my control. He want me to be a millionaire. He want everybody to be a millionaire. See, that's not the God I serve. The God I serve got different jobs for different people. We just read it. He said, to each one he gave a gift, a measure of faith. 
Some think this for the hell of a million dollars. Some ain't going to have no money, but they're going to maybe do more in the eyes of people than the one that got the million dollars because they won't ever see what the person with the million dollars is doing. But everybody got a gift and everybody got a job. And that's the God I serve. I serve the God of the Bible I read. I don't get an idea about God and then take it to the Bible to prove it. I go to the Bible to learn him. And so this Easter, I pray I got about five people's attention because of what's going on. And that those five people will become those who will say, God, I know you. I'm called to mature in my faith and to be able to clearly see what you're saying. I don't want to guess what you're saying. I don't want to think I know what you're saying. I want to see what you're saying when you speak. I want to be like Habakkuk. Go to my watch and to my tower and watch to see what you're going to say and how you're going to reprove me when you speak. I want to be the one who want to know what you got to say, Lord, so I can understand why you sent your son to the cross. After he bled all over Jerusalem, why did he die? Because all I really know about is your blood. I know it. I plead the blood, and the blood covers me, and I plead the blood over everything. And I know about the blood, but I don't really understand the cross. Lord, if he bled, and the same power in his blood is in the cross, then why did he die? See, I got to read my Bible clearly. I got to read Romans 6. I got to read Romans 7. I got to understand that he says, as long as a man is alive, sin can have power over him. The law have power over him. But if the man died, the law have no more power over him. If a woman husband is alive, she under the authority of her husband. That's Romans 7. But if the husband died, she can be married to another. He said, you also. So it is with you. We were married to the flesh. We just saw that in Galatians 4. She said, Hagar represents the flesh. Those who are not come by this cross, we still married to the flesh. We still have a relationship with the flesh. And the flesh cannot come into God's presence. And the flesh is not talking about your body. Read your Bible. He talking about two different things. He said that we know that the old unrenewed self, the flesh, was nailed to the cross so that the body, which was just the instrument of carrying around the nature of the flesh, so I can have a body that is not manifest in the nature of the flesh. But you got to read your Bible. Today, what are we talking about? We're talking about Resurrection. Resurrection life. That it is the same as crucified life. You don't get one without the other. If we go after what Paul is talking about here in Philippians 3, to have this resurrection life, he said, we got to know the fellowship of his suffering. He says, verse 11, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I could go further, but I'm going to stop right here. said a lot, I always do, because I could go another hour, I could go another two hours explaining to you this mystery, Christ in you, Galatians 2.20, this is the mystery, that it's no longer I that live, but Christ living in me, this only happens because of the crucified Savior. That Christ was crucified. He died so that we might have this life. This is not a time, and I've been I've been building up to this for the last weeks. Because this is not a time for us to, to 
to have any thought of eggs and bunions. The world don't need another egg or another bunny. The world needs the cross. The Lord himself knew that's what we needed because that's what he sent. If we had needed something else, I think God would have sent it. God sent the cross so that we might know and be able to be in relationship with him again. Jesus was willing to go all the way. They began to beat him. They whipped him sore. In the fulfilling of the prophecies, he had to take 39 lashes. of a whip that's supposed to kill a man. When it beats you, it's snatching your skin open, causing great pools of blood to, to descend to the ground. When it hits you with it, it don't always hit you in the back. It'll wrap around you to the front. You fall down, it may hit you on the neck. The Bible said that when he, when he, what his mother didn't even recognize him. How can we, how can we back out of the fellowship of his sufferings when he's not asking us to go through that? The only thing he's asking you to do is give up that old nature. That nature that caused you to be untrustworthy. That nature that caused you to be a menace. Sometimes deceitful. Sometimes just hurtful to people. Unreliable. Selfish. All he's asking us to do is to give up that old nature, to let that nature die and a new life come forth. My prayer for you right now is that you'll be able to receive it. And that we will be those who not only receive it for ourselves, but we will begin to tell the truth as it is in the Bible. Stop trying to patty cake folks. Cake and folks got a got an impotent church in the midst of a crisis. Now, if we was the first responders, and this was the fire department and the health department, and they was not, I mean, come on now, we'll be we'll be outraged because they're supposed to be the response to this crisis. But we're the church, we're supposed to be the response to this crisis. But we're impotent. We don't have no strength. We don't know what to do. We don't even know where we fit in. What are we supposed to do? Because you don't know the Bible. You don't understand what he wrote. He wrote it so that we could be ready. Not so we could be somebody kicked back. Wait until it's over with. That you'll be in your prayer closet with the Lord saying, Lord, show me what to do. That you'll push back and turn the TV off and get along with God and begin to pray like you should have been praying. But some of us don't even know how to turn it off and get on to that because at the end of the day, that just ain't where we at. He said, and, and what we started in Hebrews, he said that, I mean, Romans 12, he said that we will be out there feeding the poor. That we'll be loving on the unlovely. That we'll be counseling those who need counseling. That we'll be out there on the front line. He said, this is, this is your reasonable service. Read Romans 12 in its entirety. Don't just read the first couple verses. Read the whole thing. I want to see us respond to Christ the way he responded to our need. 
He did not refuse those who whipped him. He didn't refuse those who pulled out his beard. He didn't back away, even though he said, let this cup pass from me. Once he decided that it's God's will, he, he pushed his way. Some of us would have just laid down on the ground. But he pressed his way to, the, to Golgotha. And when he got up there on that cross and he went through all the things that the Bible prophesied about him, that he would thirst and say, Father, why has thou forsaken me? He went take the time to stop dying save one more person a thief who none of us would have taken and given the time of day he took the time to tell the thief today you can be with me in paradise and because of your faith you will be with me in paradise he took the time to, to look at his mother and said mother behold your son son behold your mother talking to John he took the time to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He took the time in the midst of his dying to make sure that he covered everything he needed to cover for us. We never would have made it to the cross. We would have laid there and died after they beat us. But not only did he die, I mean, not only did he uh, take the beating, but he pressed his way to the cross. And then when he got up there, he said everything that he needed to say. And at the end, he said, guess what? It is finished. Because he had done what he needed to do for us. And then he came back. Gathered his disciples who were scattered. Gathered them, encouraged them. Met two men on the mayor's road. They were dis disappointed and downtrodden. Jesus said, what's wrong? He said, do you not know what's going on in Israel? The man who we thought was the Savior, the one who we had all our trust in, he died. Now we lost. We don't know what to do. And the same Jesus who just had got off the cross and, 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 and went down the hill, took captivity captive and came back. After all of that, he was still patient. The Bible says he started at Moses. He walked with those men. He told them the story on the man's road. When it got evening time, they said, they said, come go with us. Like what you're talking about. You're encouraging our hearts. So he went home with them and sat down to eat bread with them. And when he broke the bread, they realized it was Jesus all along. This is the same Jesus that he's right now. He's patiently waiting on you. Even after you turn your back on him. Even after you didn't do the things you said you would do. Even after he blessed you the way he said he would. And then you said, Lord, if you do this, I won't do that. You did it again. And he's still patiently waiting. And he sent me by to tell you the story. All over again. And if I had five people that said, they'll stay with me, I'll stay. I'll start at Moses and I'll tell it again. Because he's ready and able to help you know what he wants from you. You won't be able to say that it was because he didn't do his job. It's because we didn't appropriate what he gave us. So today, I challenge you to look at this story of Jesus Christ afresh. And if you're with me and you feel like you've heard this enough times, then that means it's time for you to tell it. But if you ain't ready to tell it, then you need to say, Pastor Charles, let's sit down and help me so I can tell it. I want to tell it the way he told it. I want to tell it the way the Bible tells it. I don't want to add nothing, take nothing away, and I don't want to be talking about no five steps to this and seven steps to that. I want you to tell the story that he died for you to tell. 
That's enough. And then he'll give you something to do. He'll raise you up and put you in a place so people can see you. He'll bring you down to a place where you can help some folks. He'll do something that will change your life and make your life complete. I guarantee you he'll do it. Won't he do it, preacher? He'll do it. And then your life will be complete. But see, right now we're trying to live according to the ways of the world. We're comparing ourselves with the world. We're not following after his way. And so therefore we're, we're disappointed and we don't know what to do. And we're feeling lost because now our economy is down and our job is doing this. And that's happening. I lost my stocks and my bonds, they went down and all of that. And because you got your trust in the wrong thing. If that's where you got your trust and that's who you believe in, then leave Jesus alone. Because you ain't going to and you ain't going to change me. I believe in him. I'm like these guys on the board. I know in whom I believe. And I'm fully persuaded. Even if he don't deliver me, it ain't because he's not able. So whatever he wants to do, I'm with him. I need some people. I need about five people like that. If I had five people like that, we'd turn the whole world upside down. Stop, stop worrying about the stuff that you can't do nothing about and put your trust in Jesus Christ. The world going to be spinning and doing all it's doing when we go. I promise you he won't let you down. I left everything that I thought I, I wanted and, and had in, in this world. I left, I walked away from it, didn't know where I was going. God put me in a little house. It seemed like it was fit to live in. People come down there now, they say, that's the nicest house on this block. It ain't, it ain't nothing to be compared to the house I had. But it's the nicest house on my block. It's a place where my family have went around the world. Huh? We haven't been nowhere prior to that. Everybody in my family has been out of the country to some other country from that house. We lived in a big house. We just had some barbecues, feed a few folks, but now we feed thousands. I'm telling you that what he wants for your life, it may not be what you wanted, but he will make you all right with it. He'll give you joy, won't he, wife? It'll give you peace. It'll take away your stress. Some of you stressed out right now and you don't know how to let go of the life you live in. And Jesus said, I died so that you can be free. But you gotta want to be free. You gotta want to be free. Praise the Lord. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you right now for what you did at Calvary. We thank you right now, Lord God, that you have given us this day an opportunity once again to come together and to hear the message of truth that your son died for us so that we might be free from the slavery of sin so that our bodies, which were the instrument of sin from birth, but no longer be active or effective for sin. Because we have died with him, sin no longer has authority over us. Lord, I thank you for the day that I came to that understanding. That day I realized something, that I'm no longer a debtor to the flesh. I don't owe the flesh any explanation for what I'm doing. I don't have to make amends with my flesh. I don't have to leave a little room for my flesh. There's some things my flesh wanted to do, never got to do. It's buried and dead now. It's over with. Just like a man, if I see a man who owe me money carrying the cross, that means I ain't gonna get that money. Cause once the cross it's laid on the man's back. He's already dead. 
to the cross, laid on my life. Folks who thought I owed them something, a lot of them lost it. Because if it was in the world, and it mean I had to sin to do it, it's over with. Because the person that used to get into that with them is dead. I believe that with all my heart. And guess what? God confirms it. But every time the devil wants to resurrect that old nature, the cross crushes it again. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, there's some people that are listening to me, and Lord, for the first time in their life, they thinking that there may be an opportunity for them to break free from the bondage of sin. And right now, Lord, I pray that they will take this opportunity and surrender their life to you. Surrender themselves so that, Lord God, Everything in them, Lord God, that once was attached to sin and the slavery thereof and the flesh, Lord God, that it will be dead. As Romans 6 says, in Romans 6 and 6, that our old unrenewed self be nailed, nailed, nailed to that cross with Christ. So that our body will be free from that slavery to sin. Lord, Romans 12 said, though, once we make this sacrifice, he said there's something that has to happen. And we got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we have to stay in the word. This comes through discipleship. Discipleship is the way that you transform our mind. It's like digging a well. Lord, help us to learn to, to not dig a pool, a cesspool like we had, a, a cesspool of sin, a, a shallow cesspool life of sin, but to dig a well that goes down to that eternal living water. Help us to know what it means, Lord, to dig down deep past all of the foolishness, the death, and all of the things that are on the layer of the surface of our life down to the well. Lord, that brings forth eternal life. Oh God, help us right now in the name of Jesus that we would understand what it means, Lord. So that we can be those, Lord, who be transformed by the renewing of our mind to that which is acceptable in the perfect will of God. To the new man so that we won't be those who think more highly of ourselves than we are. But we know that we're one with our brothers and sisters in Christ. One body. One with him. Which means, Lord God, I can't be doing all this foolishness. If I'm a person, Lord God, who I go to church and I love the Lord, but Lord, I have relational issues. I'm in a relationship with somebody who don't want to marry me. They just want to lay up, Lord, and they want to shack. And Lord God, they don't, want to, they don't want to be one with you. And so I'm torn. Lord, I pray that you will help that person, Lord, right now to break free. Because if that person doesn't want to give them what is necessary so that they can have the best life, that person is not good for them. But if it's possible that that person's life can be changed and that they can, the two can be made one and they can be one in you, Lord, let the supernatural power of God fall in that relationship and let these individuals, Lord, who once walked in sin, allow them, Lord God, to be one in Christ. But nevertheless, each one, Lord, must make a decision. Lord, if you're if, if there's someone out there right now, Lord God, who doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that you'll put around them the right kind of people. The right kind of people, Lord God, who can make a difference in their life. Lord God, we thank you right now, Lord God, for difference makers. For those, Lord God, who make a difference in the life of your people. Those who live the life and the light of life is shown through them. Lord, we need more people like that in our churches who live in the life. Let us 
as pastors and leaders learn how to disciple such lives. We need them in every church. Lord, I pray for every church that, that, that gathers in the name of Jesus Christ, that within that church there will be at least five true disciples raised up in every church. And that they will begin to infiltrate the church and cause true disciples to be born and born again in every church. That the message of Christ will carry itself all throughout the world as it did in the beginning. So we have believers who are willing to give their life for you. So we have, Lord, a place where we now have light in every dark place. Oh, Lord. And then for everybody who, who makes this decision, show us how to find our pleasure in you. Well, we found our pleasure in different places and those things, the body, Lord, sometimes it's hard for us to, to get rid of those old habits. But I pray right now for supernatural overcoming power so that our habits and our, our joy, our, our pleasure, will be found in you so that the things we do we don't have to be ashamed nor hide or do it in the darkness but Lord God we can bring all things to the light that for those who got boyfriends they'll have husbands and those who have girlfriends will have wives for those Lord God who like to gamble and begin to find pleasure in a sure thing for those Lord God who, who have made a, a living on deceiving people that they will, Lord God, become solid people who bring a contribution to our communities, who work hard, and, Lord God, are, are compensated fairly. I pray for those, Lord God, who, uh, Lord, they, they, they like the nightlife and they like the street life. Lord God, that they will become those creatures of the day and not of the night. We pray for those, Lord, who live an alternative lifestyle homosexuality is at, on the rise women with women and men with men all of this is in disobedience to what you said Lord it's not about whether or not it feels right or what you said it was not right Lord let them Lord like anyone else those who, who uh, like to have sex with children and those who like to commit adultery and all of us, Lord God, who have sexual sin in us, Lord God, that, that would cause you to not be able to fellowship with us. Let all of us see it the same way. That for your sake, Lord, we'll do it the way you prescribed. Let every woman have a husband that's a man. Let every man choose a wife that's a woman. And let us, Lord God, put aside those perverted things no matter how real it feels Paul said he counted everything as nothing he counted it as loss but we don't hate anyone or despise or look down on anyone but we want all to be free from sin which is rebellion we didn't make it to look at the scripture that talked about the rebellion of one you know in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the sin of one corrupting many, the rebellion of one corrupting many, but also the obedience of one, which is Christ, bringing all of us into glory. Let it be so amongst us, Lord, that through the power of Christ's obedience, we might become obedient children. Lord, I pray sincerely for everyone who struggles. Let the struggling end at the cross. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. And Lord, we just give your name praise, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for the safety of our cities. Lord, with a storm coming on top of the, the COVID-19, Lord, we pray for safety and protection. Lord, let it be so amongst us that we will be protected and safe. Lord, I thank you right now, Lord God, for everything you've done and everything you're doing. And we give you all the glory, the honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.